our members and the guests for this uh, webinar on hydrogen economy. I thank uh, Mr. N. S. Venkatraman and his son Swaminathan for accepting our invitation to make presentation on this interesting subject. And uh, no introduction is required. Sir, sir, sir sorry, 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 no, agla. Sorry, 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 no, agla. Poi trikhi pada. So prepare agde or nimsha. Ah. Good evening to all of you. On behalf of Chemical Industry Association, I welcome all our members and the guests for this today's webinar on hydrogen economy. I'm Ilana Gay, President of the Chemical Industry Association. First, I welcome our guest speakers, Mr. N. S. Venkatraman, uh, Nandini Consultants from Chennai, and Mr. Swaminathan, Nandini Consultancy from Singapore. They have agreed to make uh, the presentation on that uh, interesting topic, hydrogen economy. I thank them. I also thank uh, Ramnath and company, Mr. Venkatesh Swaran and Harry, for sponsoring this event. I thank uh, Mahendra Kumar, uh, who is constantly supporting CIA to conduct such webinars. And uh, hopefully, we will continue to do such seminars uh, in the coming days also. I think everybody knows about the use of hydrogen. Hydrogen is primarily used in the chemical industries as some of the cast soda industries, they use it as fuel. Nowadays, they have started using it for the manufacturing of hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen is mainly used in the process of hydrogenation. Many specialty chemical industries, including our company, CTEX Petrochemical, we use the hydrogen, which is coming from the process, for hydrogenation process and make a value-added product like uh, MABC and uh, aroma chemicals. Bombay, many industries, they make hydrogen from methanol and they use it for uh, aroma chemical manufacturing. And uh, earlier days, people used to make hydrogen from naphtha, and which was not uh, economical. Then they switched over to natural gas. Wherever natural gas is available, they started manufacturing from hydrogen from uh, natural gas. And nowadays, uh, natural gas is available in many places. In fact, when I was there in Johar Bahru, uh, industrial estate in Malaysia, every industrial estate, they have hydrogen plants. They want to supply hydrogen like uh, other utilities to all the industries. This is one of the preconditions they are putting to the industrial estate. But if you take uh, India, Tamil Nadu, very rarely you get hydrogen. Only wherever you have caustic soda plant, you get hydrogen. Otherwise, hydrogen availability is becoming a big problem. Hydrogen cost is also very high. There are so many issues on this. But what Mr. Venkat Raman is going to talk, he will explain to you. He will be talking about hydrogen use as a fuel. Hydrogen can be used in many other ways. So hydrogen is uh, one of the important things which can change the economy. Like last time, he was talking about methanol. So this time, he will be talking about uh, hydrogen. Now, over to Mr. Venkat Raman. And uh, afterwards, after his introduction, Mr. Swaminathan will take over. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I will give a brief uh, introduction with regard to the concept of uh, hydrogen economy. Uh, what is uh, hydrogen economy? What is it supposed to do? And how it will benefit India? And what is the method of utilization of hydrogen economy? There are enormous prospects about hydrogen. There is no doubt about this. And uh, at the same time, there are also issues uh, in utilizing the hydrogen in an optimum manner both of which we are going to discuss it today. Now, hydrogen, as Mr. Elnagai said, is a very clean fuel, and uh, the burning of hydrogen does not emit any kind of noxious uh, gases like sulfur dioxide and all this. So it's one of the most friendly, ecologically acceptable product. There's no doubt about it anywhere. Now, as far as India is concerned, there are two compelling reasons for us to go for the hydrogen economy. Number one, use of hydrogen as a fuel. See, today, as you know, India imports around 220 million ton per annum of crude oil. We import more than 30 billion cubic meter per annum of uh, natural gas. Together, this crude oil and natural gas consume around 26% of the Indian foreign exchange earnings. Now, what is happening is unfortunate situation is the production of crude oil and natural gas in the country is now virtually nearly stagnant. Not even stagnant in the case of crude oil production seems to be coming down. The reason, as you know, the gas wells, oil wells, they deplete over a period of time. 
because of the aging wells when it so the reserve, the oil content it becomes so low it becomes uneconomical to use it anymore then the oil wells are closed when it is closed at the same time it is necessary for us to identify new sources of crude oil to compensate for the loss that we are not doing it in india adequately so net net result is we are becoming a very very big importer of this crude oil and natural gas now the crude oil and natural gas playing such an important role in the economy it will the demand for the crude oil and natural gas is likely to go up in tune with the national gdp growth which is likely to be around 6 to 7 percent per annum if this continues by 2015-16 it is expected that the import of crude oil in the country will reach around 300 million tons from the present 220 odd million tons similarly the import of uh, natural gas will touch more than 50 billion cubic meter if this is going to happen then the drain on the foreign exchange due to the crude oil and natural gas import will become a very high figure which i doubt whether indian economy will be able to sustain this is a very very serious issue and this has to be tackled so the plan of government of india is use hydrogen as a fuel to the extent possible to substitute for the use of crude oil and natural gas that is one of the objectives of this crude oil and natural gas objective of this hydrogen hydrogen economy second objective is in using the crude oil or using the naphtha naphtha uh, is the natural gas then inevitably emissions are there we produce diesel in and the automobiles and diesel so much emissions are coming there so in the case of the coal based power plants also emissions are coming up in the case of hydrogen doesn't happen at all it's a very eco friendly fuel so by substituting this uh, hydrogen for instead for, for natural gas and crude oil we will be able to bring down the emissions substantially particularly in the context of india's commitment to the paris climate conference so the twin objectives of the hydrogen economy is to reduce the import dependence of crude oil and natural gas as well as promote environmental benefits for the country these both are elegant uh, objectives which need to be attained now what is the ground reality in the year 2006 that is around 14 years back government of india constituted a national hydrogen energy board for which mr ratan tata the then chairman of the tata group was the chairman of this uh, board after deliberations they decided that in 2006 that by 2020 india should have 1 lakh hydrogen driven vehicles on the road and india must have 1000 megawatt of power based on hydrogen now unfortunately 2020 has already come nothing has happened not even one commercially proven hydrogen vehicle is on the road today not even one megawatt of power is based on hydrogen so we are not be able to reach the target that was declared in 2006 now in 1990 i attended a conference on hydrogen economy in a very leading technological institution where three eminent professors spoke and all senior people two from indian professors one from germany professors then at that meeting in 1990 they said that hydrogen is the future of the world because they were afraid professors were afraid by 2030 40 the resources fossil fuel like natural gas crude oil or coal may become nearly exhaustive if not exhausted the the yield the availability will become so low or you have to go deeper into the coal mines it may become uneconomical to produce that so only solution for the problem was hydrogen so world as you prepared for the impending crisis in 2030 40 the three professors said then they bet on hydrogen not only for the obvious reason but they said hydrogen can be made from water by water electrolysis and no world is not unlikely to go without water monsoon may fail or rain may not come but it is not going to be a permanent entity if it doesn't rain today it may rain tomorrow god never lets you down so in this scenario when hydrogen can be made uh, from water then that is the biggest best of the possibilities there so concentrate on production of hydrogen from water be ready by 2020 that is what the professor stated in 1990 around 30 years back all of us clapped and left with a lot of optimistic note and 2020 has come nothing what will has happened this is the real ground reality scenario in the country the objective of this webinar is certainly not negative the objective is not to decry hydrogen economy the objective is to highlight the pro- prospects of hydrogen economy discuss the issues for the hydrogen economy and find out some solutions for overcoming the problem that is the objective of this so the whole economy we're not today is proactive it is not negative it is positive when there are massive issues obviously they need to be uh, met by massive efforts that is what we will do 
with this uh, thing i think all of the deliberation that is going to come in the webinar we need to look with a positive mindset and an outlook of hope and confidence rather than getting defeated by highlighting the negatives too much which we don't want to do but you can find a solution for the problem only by highlighting the negatives that also needed we we'll highlight the negatives we find out the way out let us see how it goes at the end of the beat i think we'll have greater clarity all of us will be happy now over to mr swaminathan swaminathan is talking from singapore he is a chemical engineer and mba from iim ahmedabad he has over 20 years of experience in international companies swaminathan is going to speak on global scenario with like regard to hydrogen economy over to mr swaminathan thank you uh, mr elena hey thank you mr venkatraman um i will uh, share a presentation and uh, yeah i hope you can see it so i'll share a presentation on uh, hydrogen economy and uh, yeah okay now it's now it's better okay so following is what i will i'll try to cover in the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh starting with why we are discussing about hydrogen today and why hydrogen has become an important topic for discussion around the world and how hydrogen can help in energy transition uh, particularly with uh, the green economy that uh, almost all uh, countries have uh, agreed that is the direction that we need to take what is the role that hydrogen can play in the transition to the green economy what are the application areas in which we can use hydrogen where hydrogen can be competitive Uh, compared to other low carbon options or other uh, conventional options and what what are the global initiatives that are being taking place and what are the challenges and opportunities that we need to encounter for a coming hydrogen economy see the uh, whole discussion on hydrogen has been triggered by the discussion around climate change and what we can see around us see this graph shows how much the the climate of the world has changed in the last about 150 years since about 1850 which is the benchmark that the world uh, 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 is, uh, uh, has to measure the rate of uh, growth of uh, temperature the world has seen an increase in global temperature for about of about 1 degree which has been hit in 2015 all the scientists of the world agree or at least most of them that significant irreversible changes start to occur in weather patterns when global temperature increases beyond 1.5 degree centigrade and at about 2 degree centigrade it's almost a threshold for natural disasters to occur and today we are at about 1 degree or about 1.1 degree uh, rise in temperature from from the benchmark that we have so it means that we are uh, hurtling very fast towards a climate crisis if we don't change what we are doing today In 2018, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change (IPCC) uh, made a presentation and uh, exhorted the world, and most countries have agreed that we need to have a global net CO2 emission to reach zero by the year 2050 if we have to halt the rise in temperature to two degrees. If we have to do that, a path to decarbonisation becomes an imperative. Without a path to decarbonisation, we cannot find ways. to become global net co2 uh, uh, to reach net zero co2 emissions by 2050 most advanced economies have made a commitment china has made a commitment to do it by 2060 but european union and several other countries japan korea have all made a commitment to reach net zero emissions by around 2050 why are we talking about hydrogen see hydrogen is a clean burning molecule and it has no emissions no sulfur dioxide emissions no particulate emissions no carbon emissions and it's a completely clean burning molecule hydrogen can be also made more importantly from a diverse range of low carbon energy sources so the entire hydrogen supply chain from the creation of hydrogen to the consumption of hydrogen it is possible to do it with renewable electricity and absolutely zero carbon footprint that's what makes hydrogen a very attractive option a kg of hydrogen is about the same energy content as a gallon of gasoline and uh, particularly in applications like fuel cells hydrogen usage doesn't cause any emissions and makes less noise than even conventional engine so to fully decarbonize the world economy we need a clean molecule there are some options but of the options the role of hydrogen looks to be the most promising it is easily storable it is easily transportable it's clean burning and it can be produced with low or zero emissions 
the way to look at hydrogen is hydrogen is not an energy source but hydrogen is an energy carrier it's somewhat like electricity its its potential role is very similar to electricity like electricity hydrogen has no greenhouse gases particulates or sulfur dioxide emissions the difference between hydrogen and electricity is that hydrogen can be stored hydrogen is a chemical energy carrier whereas uh, electricity is more flow based in a flow based uh, flow based energy system you need to match demand and supply in real time otherwise uh, you need to store the electricity somewhere in between in the in in the role of storing electricity is where hydrogen comes into play uh, electricity can be easily converted to hydrogen and it can be stored it can be shipped and then it can be converted back into electricity in a fuel cell however we know from the laws of physics that any conversion of energy source from one to the other causes a loss of energy so in which case if you convert electricity to hydrogen and then convert hydrogen back into electricity the entire delivered uh, energy can be about you can see a loss of about 30% of energy in this whole process this is what makes hydrogen expensive and this is why hydrogen is not uh, an attractive app option as of today however if you if you look at hydrogen in a fuel cell vehicle for example the consumption of uh, hydrogen in a fuel cell vehicle is about 60% energy efficient compared to a gasoline internal combustion engine which is about 20% efficient if you look at the global demand for hydrogen today and where hydrogen is really consumed today about you can see a steady rise in uh, demand and consumption for hydrogen across the years so hydrogen is uh, a very versatile uh, source of uh, energy and it is being used however it is being used in few specific applications the most important application where hydrogen is used today is as an input in oil refining in production of ammonia for uh, fertilizers and in methanol and in manufacture of steel this is where hydrogen is used globally and about 70 million tons of pure hydrogen is used in this form today hydrogen is not used that much as an as a source of uh, carrier of energy precisely because it is a very expensive uh, material to use if you look at the hydrogen value chain which is what we are uh, the vision is the vision is to produce hydrogen with a large scale efficient renewable energy so whether it's wind or solar to use the renewable uh, wind or energy to use, to electrolyze water and to produce hydrogen this results in a clean hydrogen with zero carbon footprint and once this hydrogen is produced this hydrogen can be stored distributed across sectors across regions and can be used in a variety of sectors so the primary use of hydrogen is one it is used as a seasonal storage uh, for renewable electricity the renewables are becoming a greater percentage of uh, uh, ele electricity generation around the world however renewable energy has a problem you can't uh, create solar energy you can't generate solar energy throughout the year you can't generate wind energy throughout the year they are seasonal uh, uh, in nature so when they are seasonal in nature you have to find a way to store electricity when they are produced so hydrogen is as a option is a very attractive option for this the second uh, use of hydrogen is in decarbonizing co2 intensive sectors there are many applications where there has not been adequate uh, technological breakthroughs in using a low carbon substitute for those applications some of them are in long distance transport of uh, energy fuel for heating buildings and so on we will come to some of those applications later but these are the two primary uses of hydrogen in the energy value chain that that there is a, a prospect for if you look at hydrogen itself the production uh, we we know hydrogen is in, there is there is what is called gray hydrogen there is what is called blue hydrogen and there is what is called green hydrogen most of the hydrogen produced today is what is called gray hydrogen gray hydrogen is hydrogen which is produced from conventional co2 intensive methods from fossil fuels coal and natural gas this is this creates a, by itself a, a co2 problem by emission of a tremendous amount of co2 the other uh, uh, better options are blue hydrogen where hydrogen is produced by co2 intensive methods but with carbon capture technology so where carbon is captured at the end of the production process and either with uh, using uh, electrolysis from electricity from grid or otherwise with low carbon sources such as natural gas but at the end of the day there is an expensive uh, additional expense and uh, difficulty technological difficulty of carbon capture the green hydrogen is what the ultimate vision is which is using uh, renewable sources such as wind and solar 
to produce hydrogen using electrolysis with electricity. Today, the most of the hydrogen, about 99% of hydrogen produced in the world is grey hydrogen. And grey hydrogen itself is responsible for emission of about 830 million tons of CO2 per year. The hydrogen production itself is today equal to emissions of countries like Indonesia and UK, the annual emissions of Indonesia and UK. So hydrogen production itself today is a, is a, is a serious environmental problem. Green hydrogen is non-polluting alternative if adequate renewable electricity is used. And this is what is the vision for uh, the hydrogen economy in the future. If you look at the application of hydrogen as a seasonal storage, the, like I said, there is a, uh, a timing issue with respect to demand and supply from renewable sources. Renewable sources cannot be, such as wind and solar, cannot be produced with, uh, with equal capacity throughout the year. For example, in Germany, the renewable uh, uh, generation of electricity is typically 50% lower in winter than in summer. However, the energy demand in Germany is 30% higher in winter than in summer because of heating requirements. So as Germany goes more and more into renewable sources, there is a tremendous mismatch between the uh, ability to generate electricity and the consumption. So there needs to be a storage solution between the generation and uh, consumption of electricity. This is where hydrogen plays uh, a significant role, where electrolysis can convert the excess electricity into hydrogen during times of oversupply. It can be stored and then can be used when the hydrogen demand peaks uh, uh, in a different season. So hydrogen is deployed along with, alongside electricity infrastructure and converted into hydrogen and uh, uh, transported and converted back into electricity. Transporting uh, electricity over long distances typically causes energy losses. This is one of the advantages hydrogen has because pipeline distribution of uh, hydrogen almost has 100% efficiency with, with virtually zero loss. So hydrogen is also used as a, is being looked at, in fact, as a, as a solution for some sectors which are hard to decarbonize because technology has made very limited progress in these sectors in, in the face of uh, low carbon options. Some of them are heavy industry, for example, iron and steel, and as a feedstock in certain chemicals manufacture. Uh, hydrogen uh, is used both as a feedstock in production process and as a source of uh, industrial heat. In certain long haul and heavy transportation applications. See, battery vehicles are, uh, are making tremendous progress, but battery vehicles are making progress in passenger cars for, uh, for urban transport. Battery vehicles are not yet, making any, uh, not yet making any progress for heavy transportation applications over longer distances. So there, battery vehicles are proving to be uh, very, very expensive and alternate options are being looked at. Power and heating of industrial and resident uh, commercial buildings is another uh, 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 sector in which low, uh, low carbon options are not being uh, substituted by uh, uh, with decarbonization because there are not many competitive options yet available. In these areas, hydrogen is a leading option for uh, because it can be stored, combusted, and combined in chemical reaction. Now, this is a chart where uh, uh, the, uh, certain uh, uh, studies have been done by Hydrogen Council. Hydrogen Council is a leading uh, association in the world for uh, looking into uh, uh, hydrogen applications. It's uh, the member, uh, members of Hydrogen Council are all the leading multinationals which are involved in uh, promoting hydrogen and looking into R&D uh, in this area. And they have made a study looking at where uh, hydrogen can be feasible uh, and competitive around 2030, about 10 years from now. Now, this chart shows a comparison of hydrogen applications against low carbon solutions. When you say low carbon solutions, we're talking about battery vehicles, heat pumps, and hydrogen against conventional solutions, which are basically diesel vehicles, gas boilers from, from fossil fuels. If you look at the chart on the right up corner, these are applications where they think that hydrogen applications will be very competitive or in fact more competitive than both the conventional options as well as the low carbon options. So these are uh, areas such as uh, regional trains, taxi fleets, forklifts, uh, SUVs, large passenger vehicles, long distance urban buses, long distance coaches, heavy duty trucks. So these are applications where they think that uh, with, the, with the expected improvement in the cost of production of hydrogen in the coming years, the uh, transportation infrastructure that is going to be built and uh, for distribution of hydrogen, these applications are believed to be 
the most lucrative uh, applications where hydrogen can be used in the coming years. These together, these applications constitute about 15% of the global energy consumption. So hydrogen is not going to be the solution to solve all decarbonization problems, but hydrogen can be a solution to solve a significant number of uh, percentage of decarbonization uh, goals in, in 2030 and beyond. Of course, with, uh, uh, with scaling and, uh, and, uh, and continuous usage of, uh, of hydrogen and increase in capacity, many more applications are likely to become competitive beyond 2030 as well. The competitiveness of, of hydrogen, of course, uh, depends greatly on the region. See, there are some regions which have access to abundant, low-cost clean power, uh, a biomass or CO2. They will present uh, tough conditions uh, for hydrogen in terms of uh, competitiveness. Similarly, regions with easy access to carbon storage will also uh, face tough condition, competition for, uh, for hydrogen uh, wherever fossil fuels with CCS is the alternative. See, for example, like industrial heating or steel produ uh, production. However, uh, this is all based on uh, current cost of production of hydrogen, and uh, this could change in the coming years as the costs evolve. Just like, uh, for example, the renewable energy, solar and wind, today have become so cheap that uh, probably 10 years back, it was not estimated that it would become as cheap as what it is today. The total cost of ownership uh, for any hydrogen application depends upon the cost of hydrogen production, hydrogen distribution, and the end use equipment costs. If you look at the non-transport applications, such as uh, building heating, 80% of the total cost of ownership is driven by the hydrogen production and distribution costs. For transport applications, such as long distance uh, transportation, the end use equipment cost, which is basically the fuel cell cost and the fuel cell infrastructure may comprise about 70% of the total cost of ownership. So we need breakthroughs both in terms of the equipment cost as well as in the hydrogen production cost to make uh, the hydrogen economy viable in the future. If you look at the hydrogen production cost, for green hydrogen, it ultimately boils down to the cost of electrolysis. Uh, the cost of electrolysis already has made tremendous progress in the last 10 years. Between 2010 and 2020, the cost of electrolysis has fallen from about US 10 to $15 per kg of hydrogen to about US $6 today. In the chart on the left-hand side, uh, the Hydrogen Council, uh, along with McKinsey, they made estimates as to where the hydrogen production cost could be 10 years from now, in 2030. Today, the, the benchmark cost of hydrogen production is about $6 per kg. They think that with scale, with uh, reduces capex costs, and the estimated uh, reduction in the renewable energy cost that the total cost of production of hydrogen can go uh, can be reduced by about 60% over the next 10 years, from $6 per kg to about $2.6 per kg. Of this reduction, they think about 25% of this reduction is going to come from scale, from electrolyzer manufacturing. Today, because of uh, 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 not many application areas, the cost of electrolyzer manufacturing is pretty high because there is, it is not being produced at scale. Similarly, if you look at the trends in uh, renewable energy costs over the last 10 years, and certain projections can be made to assume the trend of renewable energy in the next 10 years, about 20% of cost of uh, hydrogen production can be reduced by the reduction in the energy power, the renewable energy cost. So about from $6 to about $2.6 is what the estimate is that the uh, hydrogen cost will come down to in the next 10 years. Similarly, in the equipment cost, if you look at it, manufacturing costs largely derive, drive the fuel cell energy cost, fuel cell production cost. So about 50% of the total cost of fuel cell is driven by the manufacturing cost. Today, fuel cell manufacturing is manual and small in scale because the applications are not there. Similarly, with scale and uh, large scale usage and uh, uh, uptake of fuel cell, about 50% of the manufacturing costs uh, of uh, fuel cell can be reduced significantly. Similarly, in the passenger vehicle applications, fuel cost is about 25% of the total cost. So there are three main factors which are likely to drive the drop in cost. The production of low-cost hydrogen, a better and larger distribution system, and a bigger and better utilized hydrogen refueling station. So the entire infrastructure, if 
there is sufficient regulation and sufficient uh, incentives and policies to create in the next 10 years a lot of scale can be created to drive the energy cost down to drive the hydrogen cost down in the next 10 years let's take a couple of application areas there are lots of application areas uh, we cannot take uh, all of them here but for example uh, i've taken a couple of uh, application areas let's say uh, taxi fleets as an application area if you uh, this is an estimate in about 2025 comparing the fuel cell uh, taxi i mean the, the total cost of ownership of a fuel cell taxi with the gasoline taxi which is the uh, ice taxi and the battery ev taxi if you look at the uh, the cost of the three applications the gasoline taxi of course is the cheapest uh, however if you impose the cost of emissions of uh, the gasoline taxi and then compare with uh, the hydrogen fleet in in about 20 even by about 2025 the fuel cell taxi fleet looks like it it could be attractive or even break even with battery ev by 2025 fleets are uh, using dedicated centralized infrastructure for hydrogen refueling of course these kind of infrastructure have to be set up but provided they are being they are set up in dense urbanized areas and there is adequate planning it is possible that fuel cell uh, taxis can be uh, can achieve break even even as early as 2025 one advantage of hydrogen fuel cell compared to a battery is that a hydrogen fuel cell has about 10 times higher energy density compared to rechargeable batteries now this is uh, uh, for a passenger car th this may not be as significant as it is for heavy duty long long distance transport for long distance commercial uh, vehicle transportation the size and uh, weight of a battery is still a very very significant cost along with the time it takes to recharge those batteries for example even for a passenger car it takes about 5 to 10 minutes for a for a hydrogen fuel cell to be recharged it takes about 1 hour even for a tesla today to be recharged so there is a significant difference in, in the time it takes to recharge and if uh, for a, for a large taxi fleet in an urban area if you look at the total cost of uh, ownership it's about almost break even so there is a, a attractiveness of hydrogen in some of these application areas that that need to be really closely looked at if you take building heat uh, 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 buildings so this is an area which has been very difficult very tough to decarbonize so this chart shows the uh, comparison between natural gas natural gas is the most common heating fuel for buildings today and and uh, heating buildings is a very important uh, sector because it represents about a third third of global energy demand uh, and about a quarter of global carbon emissions about one quarter of global carbon emissions are basically on heating commercial and residential buildings so it's it's a very very important application area and it has been very difficult to decarbonize this because there has been hasn't been a, a competitive uh, low carbon or a or a decarbonized solution to compete against natural gas so here there is a comparison of cost between the low carbon uh, options such as hydrogen boiler uh, biomethane and heat pumps these are probably three uh, options against natural gas natural gas still is the most uh, competitive uh, option and it is very difficult for uh, for any of the other low carbon options to compete even in the year 2030 even in with uh, breakthroughs that are going to be made in uh, hydrogen production cost as well as uh, uh, distribution infrastructure natural gas will continue to be the most uh, low cost option in fact hydrogen boiler can only break even with natural gas if the cost of hydrogen falls to under $1 per kg so unless there is a, a government incentive or unless sufficient uh, carbon tax is imposed on uh, on natural gas option hydrogen will not be competitive on a purely cost basis but amongst the low cost uh, low, uh, low carbon options hydrogen still looks like a, a an attractive option if you look at the uh, the regions of the world which are most well positioned to generate low carbon hydrogen so the world is divided into uh, into uh, area, regions that are uh, that are average renewable resources optimal renewable resources and optimal or uh, low carbon resources if you look at india india is regarded uh, as a region which has very optimal renewable resources wind and solar 
So we are, uh, along with countries like Australia, parts of China, uh, we are one of the most attractive locations in the world to generate renewable electricity. The, the, the regions with, which have optimal uh, uh, renewable resources can generate renewable electricity with very high load factors throughout the year. So this high load factor enables uh, production of very cost competitive hydrogen throughout the year. It is estimated that under optimal conditions at reasonable scale, uh, at a minimum scale, in these optimal regions, hydrogen production could even become available at costs of about $2 per kg in 2025 and perhaps as low as $1.20 per kg in 2030. So there are assumptions behind this, particularly around scale, because uh, the electrolyzer capacity and scale of uh, infrastructure being developed will uh, play a very crucial role in uh, determining the cost. But this is more about potential of where uh, optimal regions can be in about 2030. And this should enable uh, us in planning where India can be in about 2030. If you look at where the global R&D budgets for hydrogen and fuel cells have been around the world, like uh, Mr. Venkraman said, in around 2006, 2007, there was interest around the world in hydrogen as an option for fuel. But for cost reasons, somehow the, uh, the interest around the world declined. So in fact, the uh, R&D budget and R&D spend that has happened by government, even today has not reached the level that it peaked in 2008. So however, it is increasing if you look at it in the last few years. One big difference today is that China has started to take a very uh, important uh, and uh, interest in hydrogen. China has uh, started to put money into hydrogen projects, and, and that should be uh, a very important uh, development because China is, of course, the uh, leading uh, source of uh, CO2 emissions around the world. So with more, energy, with more energy being spent by countries again and budgets being increased, we should see some progress in the coming years. I will summarize some of the global developments that are happening uh, in hydrogen. In fact, in 2019, for the first time uh, in a G20 meeting in Japan, hydrogen rose to the top of discussion because the desire to have a clean uh, molecule for decarbonization of the world is, is what is occupying the top of minds in whole green initiatives. And hydrogen has certainly uh, 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 caught the imagination and, uh, and uh, uh, interest of uh, political leaders around the world as an option. There are about 50 policies globally today supporting investment in hydrogen in uh, G G20 countries, EU, and in the United States, the state of California is taking the lead. California has taken a lot of initiatives in uh, promoting uh, hydrogen by way of uh, hydrogen infrastructure and a lot of incentives for, uh, for production and distribution of hydrogen. In this year, early this year, uh, German Chancellor Angela, Angela Merkel highlighted the importance of hydrogen for decarbonizing the country's steel sector. And the UK has started the first trial to inject hydrogen into its gas grid. It's a, it's a pilot project for domestic heating, uh, and they want to see the results of how it is going to look. Saudi Arabia, in spite of having abundant uh, uh, low car, I mean, abundant cheap uh, fuel sources, is building the world's biggest green hydrogen facility. They have invested $5 billion and it's going to be commissioned in 2025 to produce an energy equivalent of about 15,000 barrels of oil per day. China has created a, a, a technology park at an investment of about $10 billion, 10 billion RMB, to produce uh, in the first phase about 5,000 sets per year of uh, hydrogen fuel cells for commercial vehicles with a long-term goal of about annual production of 10,000 hydrogen fuel cell systems and 10,000 complete hydrogen fuel cell uh, commercial vehicles. So China is taking a first uh, step and, uh, and a very serious step, and they are pouring money behind this initiative as well. The region that, that, is, that has probably the most uh, advanced vision for uh, hydrogen applications and what they want to do is probably the European Union. Earlier this year, in July, European Union uh, came up with a framework for a green energy transition. The European Union has uh, is also one of the signatories to become completely CO2 neutral by 2050. 
and in their energy st transition strategy they have a clear vision for hydrogen so they have clearly mentioned hydrogen and and uh, they are thinking of application areas where hydrogen can play a very important role in decarbonization so they say that hydrogen can power sectors that are not suitable for electrification of course electrification is going to be the first uh, primary uh, method by which they are going to decarbonize and sectors that are difficult to decarbonize by electrification they look at hydrogen as the most uh, competitive option and the priority is to develop renewable hydrogen produced by mainly wind and solar and they have uh, come up with specific goals where from year 2020 to 2024 they are going to install at least 6 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers in the eu and to produce about 1 million tons of renewable hydrogen from 2025 to 2030 it goes up to 40 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers and production of about 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen and from 2030 to 2050 they estimate that renewable hydrogen technology should be in maturity and they should be able to deploy at large scale across all, all hard to decarbonize sectors so eu commission has launched a european clean hydrogen alliance with leading multinationals uh, uh, the ministries of the eu uh, countries and european investment bank to drive investment in the sector germany specifically uh, is the leading country in europe uh, which is driving the whole hydrogen initiative they have targeted 5 gigawatts of hydrogen production capacity by 2030 and another 5 uh, a decade later and their goal is to make let hydrogen make about 10% of the country's total energy capacity the german gas pipeline operators have recently this year announced uh, revealed a blueprint for the world's largest hydrogen grid it should cover about 5900 kilometers they estimate that they will be able to use the existing natural gas uh, grid a part of it to convert it into a hydrogen grid and uh, that would uh, form the basis of their hydrogen pipeline infrastructure so to summarize there are uh, a lot of challenges and also opportunities the first challenge is to create a market demand See, there is a, a pro chicken and egg situation if you don't have a market demand uh, capacity doesn't scale up but if capacity doesn't scale up then price doesn't come down and price doesn't come down there is no demand so this chicken and egg situation has to be broken and governments have to play a very important part in creating a market demand for hydrogen where give they where by giving a very clear vision for the next 10 to 20 years of course producing hydrogen from low carbon energy is expensive so which means that we need to have a lot of investment in mass ma manufacturing of fuel cells electrolyzers and declining cost of renewables declining cost of renewables i think has been set in motion and i think that 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 is uh, uh, a lot of work has been done in the last 10 years and today i think solar energy is probably the cheapest source of energy in human history which is what iea has said last week the development of hydrogen infrastructure is slow uh in terms of hydrogen refueling stations hydrogen transport infrastructure and so on this has to uh, come up to complement the uh, uh the declining cost of hydrogen production that will happen in the coming years and regulations are also not up to the mark in terms of uh, international coordination such as common international standards for safety of transporting and storing large volumes of hydrogen today hydrogen is not traded across borders like lng there are not every country is uh, can produce hydrogen at economic cost uh, and not every country that can produce at economic cost can consume everything also for example japan uh, cannot produce does not have the land and does not have the ability to produce hydrogen with capacity uh, at at a very optimal cost but australia can do it and ship it to japan however you need like an lng trade which is an energy market which is happening uh, which has uh, evolved from scratch to a very very large market today we need a similar hydrogen market to transport and uh, ship uh, hydrogen across borders and also uh, an opportunity is to use existing natural gas pipelines uh, there are tens of thousands of kilometers of natural gas pipelines around the world which is already existing so it will not take a lot of investment in creating pipelines if intelligently some of the existing natural gas pipelines can be used and uh, there needs to be uh, a way of incentivizing hydrogen in transportation for long distance buses and trucks along popular routes to have a pilot to make fuel cell vehicles more competitive there has to be a little bit of imagination in this across countries but it's possible and international cooperation is needed 
to launch hydrogen trains first international shipping routes which don't exist today but establishing international shipping routes means that establishing uh, uh, ships of the requisite size uh, terminals across in countries that can accept hydrogen which can liquefy and gasify hydrogen and so on so this will involve a lot of investments but needs this needs international cooperation the way uh, an lng market has been created from scratch in the past few years so with that i conclude my talk and i uh, go back to mr uh, elanahai thank you uh, the questions uh, most of them asked about the safety of uh, use of hydrogen and what is the ideal means for storing hydrogen storing Hope people have asked about that. Yeah, hydrogen can be liquefied, and hydrogen can also be stored, uh, can also be uh, shipped in gas pipelines. So there are two options. Both can be done. Uh, of course, hydrogen is flammable, but uh, but sufficient uh, work has been done with fuel cells, for example, to make hydrogen very safe. So fuel cell hydrogen is uh, is a very safe means of uh, uh, for transportation application, and the, and there has not been a significant safety issue. of course that will that will be a cost involved in making it safe but but safety is not a problem there is uh, there is adequate uh, research that has been done and it's possible to 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 liquefy and and also ship it in gaseous form and ideal storage ideal is either uh, th that's what see hydrogen if it's transported using pipelines that's probably yes. ideal because okay. there is uh, virtually no loss of uh, energy across uh, uh, the transport and uh, uh, it can be shipped across in existing uh, pipelines the only problem is that hydrogen is is not a very dense medium so because of that the volume occupied by hydrogen is more and uh, that will that that has its own cost element involved but uh, but it's safe it's not a problem what is the cost of liquefaction that is another question um i don't have the cost with me Uh, I will have to check that, but I can come back uh, because I don't have an accurate cost at the moment. Then, uh, from my point of view, I'm asking which uh, for Indian context, uh, what do you suggest? Either we should focus on transportation fuel or uh, power. I think on the Indian scenario, Mr. Venkatram is going to uh, spend the next thirty uh, minutes. Okay. I think yeah, we will listen. cover uh, the Indian scenario in detail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Swaminathan, for an interesting Thank presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Now over to Mr. Venkat Raman. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Swaminathan. It was uh, quite an interesting talk. You have given an overview of the global scenario. I am going to completely focus on the Indian scenario, particularly highlighting the problems and the issues involved. And uh, this could be slightly disturbing to some, but when we come at a solution, things could become much better. Number one. The, as far as india is concerned the predominant objective of the hydrogen economy is to reduce the import dependence of crude oil and natural gas which may not be a compelling need for some other countries like middle east and all that secondly the ecological issues to promote there are the two objectives for that now in the hydrogen scenario in india there are two aspects one is how to massively produce hydrogen in massive quantity number one second is how to use this massive quantity of hydrogen produced profitably that is the second issue both of which we are going to answer now or rather discuss now as far as hydrogen production is concerned in india right now produces around 17000 million cubic meter of hydrogen per annum this largely comes from caustic chloride plants where they produce hydrogen as a co product and also several refineries and uh, thermal power plants have captive production facility for hydrogen largely using naphtha as the fuel there are also merchant hydrogen plants in operation in the country distributed to different people so the ba basic fact here is that indian producers of hydrogen is from somewhere around 17000 million cubic meter per year and this meets the indian demand there is not much of import or export of hydrogen now and uh, there is no much of scarcity for the hydrogen as it is right now demand and supply match each other now our objective is to replace the import of crude oil and natural gas by hydrogen to what extent it can be done it is not impossible to produce i mean replace the entire crude oil and natural gas so we will assume by 2015 25 26 we will replace at least 20% of the crude oil import and natural gas import by hydrogen if we were to do that 
Then the production of hydrogen in the country by 2025-2026 should be somewhere around 1,96,000 million cubic meter per year. You have to see this figure with regard to the present production figure of around 17,000 million cubic meter per year. Over and above the present production, we have to produce 1,96,000 million cubic meter per year. Then only we can really replace this uh, at least 20% of the imported crude oil and natural gas. Now, how to produce this massive quantity? Now, there are four ways of producing hydrogen. Number one, traditionally, we produce hydrogen from natural gas or crude oil and naphtha, which is already being done. The technology is very well known. We are also already doing it in India. All the methanol producers, all the ammonia producers produce hydrogen in the in-situ and they operate here. But that option is ruled out for us because our objective is to reduce the import of crude oil and natural gas and we can't persist anymore with the production of crude oil and hydrogen from crude oil and natural gas. So the option is left out. Second option is go for water electrolysis. This is a very well-known process known for several decades right now. There are certain issues here also. Here in this water electrolysis, one cubic meter of hydrogen requires 4.6 kilowatt hour of power. So that comes to around 4.6 units of power. That is number one. So it is a fairly power intensive unit, number one. Number two, okay, let it be a power intensive unit. Let us produce the water electrolysis. Then where is the power going to come from? The power has to necessarily come from renewable energy. That is only eco-friendly. If you are going to take the power from a coal-fired power plants or natural gas-fired power plants, it is counterproductive. That is not the objective at all because your objective is to produce eco-friendly hydrogen. See, this, this, this water electrolysis process gives you very pure hydrogen. It is absolutely emission-free. It is 100% eco-friendly. It is positive from all these points of view, but it is power intensive. So the power has to be supplied to the water electrolysis plant. How are we going to do it? It has to come from a renewable source. Now, present production of renewable source in India is just 70 gigawatt. Mr. Modi government is doing enormous efforts and to set up the production of renewable in a very spectacular manner in the last six years. There is no doubt about it. This has to be acknowledged. But still, this is not good enough for producing large volume of the hydrogen using water electrolysis process. Suppose you assume you are going to use this renewable energy. Then the problem with the renewable energy, the wind and the solar power is, as far as the wind energy is concerned, wind is not available at a good speed throughout the year. Tamil Nadu is one of the largest wind power producing stations, I mean, power producing regions in the India. Here, only five months in a year, you've got wind at highest speed. The rest of the year, the wind is at low speed, so wind power generation is very small quantity. There are a number of days seen in the last few years when the wind power generation in Tamil Nadu has become nil, zero. There was no wind power production at all because of the very low wind speed. That is number one issue. In the case of solar power, you have a problem. One, it is not night, it is not available. Daytime, it is available. But in the case of winter season, in the case of rainy season, the heat power of the sun available to the sun, your earth is much less, so you are not able to get it. So you find there is an issue with regard to ensuring availability of renewable power in a consistent manner without any fluctuation, that is an issue. Then, then what it is suggested right now is go for a hybrid power generation. Hybrid power means the same location, you put the wind power stations, you put the solar energy power stations, and then let the wind, wind, wind speed will be high normally in the night. Solar power will be available in the daytime. So both what is nighttime when solar is not available, wind will compensate for that. So this could be what is called the hybrid system. This is being uh, highlighted as one of the glorious opportunities in India. Government of India is promoting uh, the hybrid wind power, solar power system in a very big way. But even that is not the solution. Because even there, when the wind is not going to be there on several day, year, months in a year, when solar power is not going to be available at the optimal level all the time, this is not, you are not going to get it. So basically, the idea that solar, wind, water electrolysis can be done in a very big way using the renewable energy power is, I think, like putting the car before the house. It is a very tall talking without taking the ground realities into consideration, which is not going to happen. There's a limitation for setting the water electrolysis plant by renewable energy that cannot be denied by anybody, particularly the power intensive unit. Now, third thing is the cost of this uh, power generated by water electrolysis. It is generally said 
in the case of the water electrolysis to produce hydrogen the cost will be 10 times more than the hydrogen produced by the natural gas route in the case of the coal gasification the cost of the hydrogen produced by water electrolysis will be at least 3 to 4 times over the coal gasification so this is not cost effective from that point of view also so given all these facts and inputs i think it is very difficult to opt for water electrolysis for a plant as an option to produce massive quantity of hydrogen that is required mind you we need 192000 million cubic meter per annum of hydrogen by 2020 by 2026 the water electrolysis is not going to do it now there are a lot of experiments people are not given up people are saying the cost of the water electrolysis will come down okay renewable power cost will come down okay but then consistent supply has to be ensured and there is a there is a fluctuating condition in the monsoon continuous fluctuation condition in the wind power and all that the renewable power what is quantity we could produce is out of our control it is not there so it's now in australia they are putting up a new plant right now to produce hydrogen what is eco friendly hydrogen using water electrolysis process and wind renewable power they are given the task of preparing a feasibility pre feasibility report to a british company which is underway now the their capacity is planning is only small capacity that 250 meter cube per hour which is very small compared to the fact china is planning hydrogen power from coal of 1 lakh or 1.5 lakh cubic meter per hour that is the kind of thing this is only an experimental kind of thing australia has hailed it as one of the breakthrough in this uh, green power generation we always do that but then when you look at the ground reality the requirements and all this it is too small too little and it is not going to sort out the issue so we will go to the next option why not we produce hydrogen for bi- biomass it is a good idea because india has around 620 million tons of biomass available of these 620 million tons of biomass around 270 million bi- biomass is available for utilization other biomass is being captively used by the farmers for various purposes it is just not available so 270 is a good quantity 270 million biomass available is a good quantity then there is also a problem in this so there are two routes for the production of uh, hydrogen from biomass one is enzymatic route you do by fermentation alternately secondly what we call a chemical thermal uh, electrolysis plant where you produce synthesis gas and then produce out of this then here also the problem is biomass is spread throughout the country it is not available in one location suppose you want to put up a biomass plant somewhere in chennai your biomass is not going to be available in chennai you have to transport from different location to the biomass plant in chennai and it is a volumetric product freight cost is one very big issue second is specification of the biomass available biomass comes from various crops like wheat crop and paddy and all this where it is said that the specification of the biomass available from different crop residues from different sources could be different then there is a problem in stability of the plant in the case of the biomass operating that is the second problem that is coming along this third is biomass availability is also seasonal it is not available throughout the year for example now we are hearing about the stubble burning in punjab haryana polluting entire delhi the fact is you hear about stubble burning only for 3 months in a year only now every year, every year after year after year there were 3 months in a year talking about the bubble burn stubble stubble burning and the delhi going pollution becoming a very extremely tough conditions but the rest of the year we are not, not doing it obviously stubble is not available during the rest of the year so biomass availability is also seasonal without taking these consideration into consideration if you are going for the large biomass based plant for the production of the hydrogen in, to a level of around 1 lakh 96 90 uh, 90000 million cubic meter per year it is going to be a it not going to work out anywhere at all so this is also going to be given it up so all now what happened is indian oil corporation has uh, signed an agreement with the indian institute of science bangalore to produce biomass produce free hydrogen from biomass is a good move i am not saying anything about r&d but then without knowing the ground realities without finding the feasibilities if you are going for a research and development work it's going to be a non starter it will end up in paper several of the r&d work in india has ended up in a paper because the ground realities have not been taken into consideration so this biomass production of hydrogen at a massive scale is also going to be a non starter then what is the alternative the alternative is coal gasification india has plenty of coal available there is no issue here also there is a problem the coal what is happening is 1 kg of hydrogen generation you require 6 kg of coal that is okay coal is available plenty there is no problem but then when you burn the coal for 
one kilogram of hydrogen generated, 12 kilogram of CO2 is coming along with the emission. 0.12 kilogram of sulfur dioxide coming along with the emission. So it's highly polluting. Your objective of the hydrogen fuel generation is to produce in an eco-friendly way. If you are going to use coal to produce hydrogen, huge quantity of CO2 is being emitted, huge quantity of sulfur dioxide is being emitted. What are you going to do with this? How are you going to handle it? So handling the CO2 has become a very big problem. But there are solutions here. See, basically, this is much stronger proposal than biomass and uh, solar wind energy because things are under control. Coal is available. So all over the world, now what a lot of people are doing is there is two ways. The CO2 that is coming out, it is being, it's called, it's being caught. It being, that is what we call as the sequestration and capture of uh, carbon dioxide. Now, plenty of uh, carbon capture units are operating in the world. Technology is very well established. India also, a number of units are operating. So a few fertilizer units are now capturing the carbon, converting to CO2, capturing the CO2, and use it as the input for the urea plant. A soda ash plant is now capturing the CO2 and then using it as a soda ash plant. But those options are very limited. Now, if you are not going to, if you are going to use 1,92,000 million cubic meters of hydrogen, that is your target for the year 2000, it's a very conservative target. It's not a large target. It's a very conservative target. Even then, the amount of CO2 going to be generated is so high that you may not find a problem, processes to use this hydrogen to carbon dioxide. Now, plenty of research and development work is going on all over the world to develop new products for, uh, from CO2. As a matter of fact, NTPG has signed an agreement with the LNT now to develop a process for the development of methanol from CO2. Now, there are products like polycarbonate, which is being produced from CO2. India is not producing one kilogram of polycarbonate. That can be used. Dimethyl carbonate is another product. Then another very, very important way of using the CO2 is algae biofuel. So algae, Tamil, Tamil we call it the Kadar Pasi. Algae contains around 35% of the oil. You, particularly in the USA, large number of algae biofuel plants have been put up. In the case of the algae biofuel, only inputs required are one, good sunshine, lot of carbon dioxide. One algae, acre of algae farm requires 120 ton of carbon dioxide. It's a large quantity. So why not we produce algae biofuel? If you produce one acre of farm you take, use 120 tons of CO2, you produce 20 tons of biofuel. This biofuel can be mixed with the diesel and petrol, it will reduce the dependence. And here is also the issue. See, for the bio, use of algae biofuel, carbon dioxide is required, sunshine is required, then wasteland is enough, you don't require any pure water. But then the hydrogen that you generate, here that is being used now, this hydrogen generation plant, you can't have use the entire hydrogen for the algae biofuel because there is limitations. Quantity of hydrogen is so much, probably can have a thousand acres, five thousand acres, or ten thousand acres. Still, you will have hydrogen carbon dioxide left untouched. Second issue here is when you produce hydrogen, so much quantity, then you are going to utilize it. Now the CO2 that you are producing. So internationally, what people are doing, technologies are being developed. In Norway, for example. They are capturing the demo, entire CO2, transferred by a pipeline to an offshore hydrogen reservoir storage, where they are just pumping it deep into the sea. So grind, taking the CO2 and pumping it to the ground is now giving me established practice. They have already, the offshore hydrogen reservoir, they have already 4 million tons of carbon dioxide is available there, and they are able to comfortably do it. Now, there are more plants are being made to produce, uh, put up such reservoirs in the offshore to pump in the hydrogen. We have to think on these lines. We have no alternative. We have to necessarily produce hydrogen. So my suggestion is go for, go for coal gasification. And when CO2 is going to come in a large way, find out whether uh, technologies are adequately developed for the utilization of CO2. The technologies are not adequately developed. They are in the pipeline. It may take a few years to really get a developed technology. Until then, you can't afford to wait because 2015 16 is coming when your foreign exchange is going to be virtually it's great difficulty to do the import of crude oil and natural gas. So take this and simply store the hydrogen. That technology is available. There's no constraint as far as that is concerned. Now, what China is doing? China is now promised that they will become a carbon neutral country by 2050. So they are putting massive uh, hydrogen projects from coal. Their capacities are all 1,25,000 meter cube per hour, 5 lakh meter cube per hour. Massive plants are being put up. Right now, what China is doing is they are escaping. They are allowing the CO2 to go up. It is a closed country. 
nobody knows really what is happening they are because they are still waiting for the carbon capture technology process to be developed they don't want to wait until then some of most of these is going and there is another interesting thing china has done we have to learn from them they are creating what they call as a hydrogen energy park that is a very fantastic idea so you go and set up a coal based hydrogen plant in a area where hydrogen consuming centers are located power plant is there see huge consumers of hydrogen is a power plant cement plant so these are all the kind of areas where a lot of hydrogen is being used so set up a hydrogen generation plant near those units and then uh, use the hydrogen hydrogen there because the transportation of hydrogen over a long distance is extremely difficult issue we are not going to find a solution for this mainly because transportation of pipeline over a long distance means you have to lay a pipeline you know this populated country every issue is looked from political point of view displacement is going to come you are not you going to put up a hydrogen uh, pipeline the entire country throughout the country it's going to be extremely difficult and may take around several several years to do this we can't afford to wait we can't do this so best thing is put take the hydrogen generation plant to the near the consuming center that is what china has done create energy park where energy park set up thermal stations only near a place where hydrogen is available you can transport it up to 50 km without any difficulty cement plants are there this kind of things hydrogen consuming that is there if possible you also put some small algae biofuel plant take the co2 from the plant and put it here that is also possible so ultimate solution that you are going to get here is produce hydrogen in a massive way by coal gasification that is the only way of doing it and that is what china is doing it now in the course of coal gasification when you do what is the cost in china number of plants have been set up one plant that was commissioned last month was have a capacity of 125000 normal meter cube per hour of hydrogen from coal coal to hydrogen they call it the investment is 1625 1625 crores of rupees they have invested that is a reasonably uh, investment level that includes carbon capture technology so china that unit claims they are not causing any pollution because they are entirely capturing the carbon as a co2 they are how they are going to use the co2 they have not conveyed in their particular i sent a mail to them they are not care to reply to me they how they are going to use the co2 i don't know obviously they are going to store it underground that's what they do we need to follow these kind of things at all then how many of these kind of plants are required So India, given the fact that one lakh ninety six thousand million cubic meter of this is required, you have to emulate China and go for a capacity of one lakh twenty five thousand meter cube per hour of hydrogen based on coal, which means India needs around two hundred units of capacity one lakh twenty five thousand meter cube per hour hydrogen. Let us not get frightened. Massive problems come, then you have to have a massive solutions. You can't solve a major problem by a small solution. You have to think on this. So set up these hundred plants. Set up a CO2 based uh, particular plant. Now, what is the cost of production? That is the next question is going to come. See the carbon carbon stay car, car, carbon dioxide. That is what we call a sequestration. It is estimated that around for capturing one ton of CO2, it per cost is around thirty US dollar per ton. That is number one. Now, second thing is requirement of coal is around four for six tons of coal. Given this factor, now in India, cost of carbon plants. Are selling hydrogen at a price of around forty rupees per cubic meter. Our rough calculations show, in Indian condition, that possibly the cost of production of the hydrogen from coal gasification, with investment as high as thousand six hundred twenty five crores or rupees, will be well within fifty meter cube, fifty rupees per meter cube, given the cost of hydrogen, given the cost of uh, sorry, cost of coal, given the cost of power that is required there. All together, probably will be within this kind of range. No careful estimations have been made so far in the production of the hydrogen fuel. At least not in the public domain. If Niti Aayog has done something in the secretly inside this, which I don't know, but they have not come out with any statements. The fact here in this all these problems is, this, with regard to the hydrogen economy in this country, is we are talking big. We are assuming massive uh, targets, and ground realities are being ignored. Fundamentals are being ignored. we think we will solve the problem as it comes suppose indian oil corporation has given a technology license uh, arrangement with iisc to produce hydrogen from biomass it's going to take four or five years is it the time frame we have in mind so what you need to do is simply buy the technology from abroad for coal to coal gasification plant find out the technology from abroad for storage of uh, carbon dioxide wait till wait till such time that good projects based on carbon dioxide for which technologies are readily available in the world are coming until then you store the hydrogen this is the only way of doing it is here 
So one thing is we have to need to keep in mind: eco issues. When it is there, there is a price angle to this. So suppose I am producing hydrogen at a 40 meter cube per hour, so selling hydrogen at 40 meter cube per hour. By coal gasification, I am going to have 60 cubic, 60 rupees or 60 by rupees. Don't frighten away, because this eco issues have a price to pay, and the world is admitting it. World is admitting it. World is admitting. Nobody is disputing the fact. If there is a little more uh, price that has been paid for an eco-friendly issue, it is a price we can afford to pay. For example, I tell you now the power plants. Government of India is insisting that all the power plants should have sulfur desulfurization plants. Power plants are complaining that is not going to give me get a return. Then what do you do? Government of India says, "Go ahead, we will do that. If there is going to be a cost increase of power, let it be." Same thing. Now they have included the bar standard six for the automobile vehicles. Now their automobile vehicles are not going to get any returns out of it, but they have to spend a lot of money for this. The refineries are spending a lot of money for BS sixteen. They are not going to get any money or money out of this. But then it is still being done. For the sake of ecological issue, that is a car. That is angle that we have to do it. So my solution ultimately is that produce hydrogen at massive scale by coal gasification. Use this uh, to put up the plant near the consuming centers for the CO2, so that it don't transport the CO2 over a long time. And as far as the captured CO, I mean, transport the hydrogen for over a long time. And the the cost CO2 is simply store it for some time, and the storage cost is included. That is what this guy, this Chinese company has told me. They are including the storage cost. That we need to do a study. That has not been done so far in India. That is my regret. See, the we are talking about the 1990 about the hydrogen scenario. We are talking about 2006 about the hydrogen scenario. 2020 has come. Basics are not being attempted. So first, accept the problem instead of trying to. Uh, either it, I mean, ignore the problem and say I am going to have hydrogen economy. Now, in the case of hydrogen, one how to use the hydrogen? Two things is use it as a power source for large power consuming, I mean, coal fuel consuming units like cement plant, a power plant. Using a, use hydrogen as an energy source. Second thing the government are talking about is the fuel cell. It's not a bad idea. In the fuel cell. What we do is hydrogen is not burnt. But hydrogen is taken in the fuel cell, subjected to electrolytic uh, reaction to produce power. The power is used for driving the vehicles. Here, the issue is now if you want to have a fuel cell for running the automobiles, automobiles are running throughout the country. How are you going to supply hydrogen for the fuel cell? Suppose now what is happening here is now, for example, Indian Oil Corporation has put up an R&D center for the development of fuel cell. Okay, it is working all right. Now they say we are going to use this fuel cell to run 50 buses in Delhi. Probably some ministers will come and inaugurate, and it will be a headline in the paper. What benefit for the country out of this? Then we have to find a solution for the problem by running 50 automobiles in Delhi using the fuel cell. We are not solving the problem. Same thing. There is one National Solar Energy Commission is there. They have put up a, I mean, a fuel cell plant, but using solar power. But they have not given the economics out of it because it's a pilot plant. You don't have to look into economics. And then what is happening is they will be producing whenever the solar power is acquired. Is it going to be a practical solution? It is not going to be a solution. So we have to attack the problem strictly and do this. Now there is one more issue. Even as the government of India is pledging itself for the hydrogen economy, it is also pledging itself for the electric vehicle. It is not conflicting. Both are complementary. In the case of electric vehicle, we need to have lithium-ion battery. Now in, suppose you assume that two percent of the automobile run today. Or three percent of run today has to be replaced by this lithium-ion battery. The capacity required for lithium-ion battery in India will be 17 17 gigawatt by 2024-25. Not a single kilogram of lithium-ion cell is being produced in India. We are importing lithium-ion cell for using as a storage battery, by battery storage. We are not producing lithium-ion cell. Some projects are being planned. Some are various stages of implementation, but there is no guide date deadline as to when it is going to be ready. Meanwhile, the Niti Aayog made a astonishing statement: by 2030, entire electric vehicles in the country will be on electric vehicles in the country will be on uh, electric. I mean, based on electric vehicles. I don't know why, how they fix the target. This is the problem in India. We have to have the facts, put down the ground reality, find a solution, a time-bound solution, and then, if necessary, go and buy the technology. That is what government China is doing now. Developing technology for the fuel cell is totally a waste of time. When are you going to develop? When are you going to put the thing? Just go. Technology is available. Fuel cell is available all over the world. Go and acquire technology, even at a cost. That you do it. So that kind of thing which you have to do. In the case of this uh, EV vehicle, there is a lacuna. I am not discouraging. I am lacuna. 
basic problem here is we are not producing lithium ion cell meanwhile electric cars are started running government is giving subsidy more and more electric cars have come that means you have to import more and more lithium ion cell okay plants are being put up for lithium ion cell so lithium ion cell is going to produce in a massive scale you assume then lithium ion cell requires lot of chemicals one is you only need nickel you need lithium you need cobalt there is no production of lithium in india there is no production of nickel in india there is no production of cobalt in india world production of cobalt is largely concentrated in congo and china has come to an arrangement with congo that 85% of this uh, cobalt ore developed in Ch- available in congo is brought to china they are processing it and they are cornering the entire cobalt for the production of lithium ion battery they have got a stangle hold over the lithium ion battery in china now further okay these are the three basic things then the lithium hydroxide we are not producing of the purity required lithium carbonate we are not producing then we need cathode cathode actives and anode actives for lithium ion battery cathode actives are like lithium cobalt oxide lithium manganese oxide lithium manganese aluminum oxide lithium titrate so many things not a kilogram is being produced nobody is thinking of producing this chemical at all in the case of natural graphite we have got plenty of natural graphite available but we need a purity of 99.5% nobody is thinking of this we need electrolytes we need separators nobody is producing electrolyte for this so what we are doing is without a basic foundation we are going for electric vehicles without knowing where is the lithium ion battery going to come from where is this uh, chemical required for lithium ion battery is going to come down so we are not planning at all see when you really go for this you plan for lithium ion battery then you go for the chemical input the component required for this develop this plan so we are doing off way and say everything is okay this is how it is a problem this is how the problem for my session we go for the basic stage attack the issue from the fundamentals that what we have to do so it is not, as if finally i will not say that india is running out of ideas india is running out of choice we are not running out of ideas we are not running out of choice we have to necessarily reduce the import of crude oil and natural gas we have to necessarily be environmental friendly given the various options there go and produce large quantities of hydrogen using coal as a feedstock that captures the carbon dioxide that if you can find a solu- solution by using the carbon dioxide for derivative product do it if you are not going to solution point a solution for carbon dioxide the disposal then simply store it underground the cost of production of hydrogen by the co2 as i told you is not going to be prohibitively expensive the country can afford one day thing is don't experiment with indigenous technology don't say i am going to develop technology just develop it bring the technology by broad straight away put this facility as far as the lithium ion battery i have nothing against electric vehicles it's except there are some issues for example in the case of the hydrogen recharging it takes 5 minutes in the case of lithium ion battery even in the case of tesla tesla one of the foremost people in the involved in the field the car takes around the lithium ion battery takes around 1 to 1 1/2 hours for recharging who is going to wait for 1 1/2 hours for recharging recharging stations are not available so given this factor attack this fundamental issues don't give the target beyond capability of reaching and fix a target that is reachable for which work out a solution that is all the objective of this hydrogen webinar thank you thank you mr venkatraman and uh, one question is about the fuel cell cost somebody has asked what will be the cost of uh, fuel cell this is a very uncertain question mainly because yeah. the fuel cell as far as india is concerned there is no production of fuel cell only experiments are being done the pilot plant it has been developed pilot plant cost you cannot take it as the cost of this uh, fuel cell so as far as the commercial fuel cell manufacture is concerned it is only a guesstimate in india as far as this is concerned i don't have an exact figure with all this maybe i will try to find out but what i am going to find out is not going to be a correct figure it is because only the pilot plants have been set up the pilot plant basis cannot be considered for a commercial fuel cell plant i can give you the figure in china whoever wants it can send a mail to me i will reply to him by tomorrow day after tomorrow Okay, so one more question from Prabhakaran about LNG CNG vehicles. What is the yeah. strategy? I think uh, it is coming in a big way. Now, yeah, CP gas distribution is there and Indian oil and other oil companies are putting up uh, many CNG stations across the country. Only in Tamil Nadu, we have uh, it's not started in a big way. But uh, how do you compare uh, the uh, CNG versus hydrogen in transportation fuel? It's a very, I mean, very, good, and, very, very, uh, very good question. Very, very good question. i will be very happy to about the situation if natural gas is available plenty in india like it's available in iran or qatar or kuwait or saudi arabia the fact is you don't have natural gas available so you are going yeah, to import assuming that we can import we can import, import at the 4 dollar 3 dollar per 
million BTU. There is an issue in importing. You can import. See, natural gas price is subject to fluctuation. You can't take an Indian economy to a situation where things go out of control. Very objective. We are discussing about the hydrogen economy here. Yes. Keep the economy under control. Don't sub make yourself subject to international fluctuation. That is what is happening. Suppose crude oil price goes up, nothing you can do except blickering, and then price will go up, go up, go up, go up. In the case of LNG, there is a big difference. See, for example, in the case of Iran, when they develop natural gas, it is available. When the same natural gas is brought down to India, it has been liquefied, regasified, and transport. So as of now, the price of the natural gas is very low, mainly because of international crude price. There is no assurance the price of the natural gas is going to remain so low all the time. That is number one reason. Assume that it is going to work. Second problem is going to be pipeline transaction, pipeline laying. How are you going to transport the natural gas LNG from one center to another consuming center? You know the notorious statement of the Kochi LNG project. Kochi LNG project has they have put five to five million tons of uh, LNG plant there. They have spent more than six thousand crores. The plant has been until recently have been operating five percent, incur a huge loss because they have not been able to put a pipeline. We have not allowed three hundred kilometers of pipeline has to go to Tamil Nadu. That has not been allowed by the you know whoever it is. That has not been allowed. So the complete project stand is quite standard. Now they are alternately Kerala government has tried to interfere very skillfully and decided okay okay I cannot handle Tamil Nadu I will handle Karnataka so they are putting the pipeline to Karnataka which I am told is 90 percent over there is some lot bottlenecks are there so this is an issue suppose you have an LNG terminal in Chennai five million ton capacity you can use it in Manali you can use it probably in Sriperambudur and all this but our idea is. To take it to 1,750 kilometer, you have to take it, go to Trichy, take it to Kwaimato, take it to True to Green, and all this. And how are you going to do it? The pipeline has to go through the I see highly dense population. It has to go through the agricultural land. You may have to somehow demolish the houses. I don't know whether any plans have been made. That is in the public domain how to, how they are handling it. I am keeping my fingers crossed. If natural gas is going to be available at low price, see natural gas is also not uh, very eco friendly. Because what is happening is the natural gas processing. The process there is no emission, but what they call as a fugitive emission, the leakage in the pipelines of natural gas is a very big issue. United States, yeah, during the Obama administration, a very big survey was made, and they found of the total natural gas utilized in the USA, 2.9 percent of the natural gas is lost due to the leakage. Leakage means what? Methane. Methane emission is a very big issue. Methane is highly potent uh, greenhouse gas. Much more potent than the carbon dioxide. It is a matter of huge concern, but nobody is measuring this uh, methane because the fugitive loss nobody knows. So the Obama administration last days he wanted to issue an order limiting the methane emission, asking the companies to say how much they are doing it that they are not taken off because of the change of the president in U.S. at the time. But this is an issue. So don't let us not be under the impression that natural gas is absolutely eco-friendly. It is not eco-friendly. Methane emission is a problem. It is unpreventable. But then it is a question of cost. The question of cost. And you will become very vulnerable to international price scenario for a crude oil and natural gas. That is something which has the potential to destabilize the country, which we should not allow this ever. I am not at all in favor of the using the natural energy when there is a better option of using the hydrogen. Okay, you know we will have a panel discussion with the Indian oil LNG team uh, maybe in the next month or sometime. I will organize with Venkat Raman also in the panel. We will have it. And uh, one question to Mr. Swaminathan: What, is, how does uh, Singapore uh, view on this hydrogen? I think uh, Singapore is not uh, uh, not yet. Uh, I think in a big way taken up uh, hydrogen. I, I think there has been no big uh, announcements or initiatives, as far as I know, that has come from Singapore on hydrogen itself. Um, I don't know if uh, because this is a this is just a city state. And uh, I don't know if they can scale uh, and, and achieve economies of scale in, in a technology like uh, which is which is quite nascent at this stage. Maybe they are watching what is happening around the world before they take a stance. But uh, so far, there have not been big announcements on on, on uh, either. Uh, but there is no no hydrogen vehicle like electric vehicle. There is no hydrogen vehicle running on the road now in Singapore. Not hydrogen vehicle. No. Thank you, Swaminathan. Thank you, Ms. Vengat. I mean, I think more questions will come uh, from our people. I will forward to you. Yeah, we will. And do that. I think, yeah, we will continue the interactions. And uh, thank you very much for uh, taking uh, such a long time and explaining the hydrogen economy to all of our members. I yeah. once again thank uh, Nandini Consultant.
uh, for the excellent presentation and thanks for the sponsors uh, ramnath and company thanks to the office bearers and members of caa for participating in this webinar and more such webinars will be organized with the help of eminent people like uh, venkatraman in the future thank you very much all the best thank you very much அந்த 